Well, good morning. We're delighted to have you with us this morning here in church, in person, but also online. Welcome to Triadelphia Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's a beautiful Sabbath out there. We just spent two hours worshiping in the amphitheater, and it was cold, but it's nicely warming up. It's a blue sky sunlight reminding us of the freshness of God's love. I hope you had a good week. I hope you somehow... God has been very clearly visible in your life. He has in my life, and I'm grateful for that. Here are some, some announcements we would like to share with you that you can remember for the upcoming week of for our local congregation, Tridelphia Church. This afternoon, at 2 o'clock, we have our adventurer induction outside in the amphitheater, so We'd love, if you have any relationship to some of our adventurers, a grandparent, a parent, an uncle, an auntie, or somebody who just loves little children, why don't you come and join us at 2 p.m. in the amphitheater? Once that's over, at 5.30, we're planning a Vesper meeting tonight. At 5.30, also in the chapel in the woods, and we would love you to come and join us there. No transmission of this one. This one is in life, so you may enjoy some, some warm fellowship. By the way, we have nice fire braces there, or some fire uh, pots that, that do help a little bit with the cold. We'd like you also to remember that Forecasting Hope will continue tonight at 7 p.m. and tomorrow. And we'd like you to pray for all those who are connecting with God's Word through this this serious evangelistic series. We are delighted that you can join us today. Um, I'm particularly delighted that um, Gabriel Begler will be the one who breaks the bread of life with us today. He's one of our church members and elders. Gabriel comes originally from Argentina. And he's a dear colleague. We work together at the same um, department in the General Conference and Advanced Review Ministries. And I know you will be blessed today. Um, before we go and, and read the call to worship, let me just remind you also, I was reminded, that, that tomorrow morning at 9.30, there's also a women's ministry meeting here in the church, I understand. So I think these are all the announcements out for today. We pray that in a special way, God will bless you. Particularly also looking forward, I just looked at her, at Rachel's special music. I heard it already this morning. It was wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, let's, let me invite you to open the Word of God and share the Word of God. But before I do this, sorry, my wife is just showing to me that I nearly forgot something. Today, Sabbath, is the... Sabbath, where we emphasize in a special way the spirit of prophecy and Adventist heritage. And, you know, obviously I'm married to a, somebody who's working in the white estate, which has been tasked to work with the spirit of prophecy and her writings. And I'd like to make a special appeal. I don't know if you've seen this one. This book is called Jesus' Name Above All Names. It's the new devotional for 2021 by Ellen White, and it's, it's a very unique angle. My wife and actually many of the directors in the White Estate have feel that this is one of the best devotionals that have been compiled. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an academic, so I say one of the best. She said the best. Why? Because it focuses on every day on one name as Jesus, as Ellen White describes the, the life and ministry of Jesus. She has more than 800 names describing Jesus, and they selected 365 and focus on one for each day. I, I know you will be blessed, so make this maybe a, a project to get this for, for the new year. We are grateful that we can open the Word of God freely. I'd like you to invite you wherever you are, in here in the, in the um, building or online, to get your Bibles 
and we're going to read Psalm 73, verses 16 to 19. Psalm 70, uh, sorry, 72, verses 16 to 19. And I'm, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Verses 16. There will be an abundance of grain in the earth. On the top of the mountains, its fruit shall wave like Lebanon, and those of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God. God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Wherever you are, I invite you to, to pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts. Because we realized that it's your presence that blesses us. It's your sacrifice that saves us. And it's your love that brings us through right through the end. We're grateful for this this morning. We want to say thank you once again for your compassion on us. We have a number of prayer requests that we'd like to bring before you as a church. We want to pray, first of all, for an outpouring of your spirit. We realize again and again that only through your spirit will we be able to stand, to share, and to love as you have loved. We pray in a special way for those who are struggling in our congregation. We want to pray for, for those who are struggling emotionally, financially, health-wise. We think of Sam Cooper and DJ and her care for DJ. We, th we think of Nancy Engel, Peggy's sister. We think in a special way of Ian Barrow's mom, who's agonizing for many weeks now. We pray for, in a special way, that on the Sabbath day, she will truly be pain-free and be resting in you. We thank you for hearing these prayers. We know that there are so many other concerns that may be hidden somewhere, so many other pain that we're not aware of, but you know them. And we pray that wherever we are, wherever we listen to this and sit and Worship that you know our pain. We commit the Sabbath worship service into your hands. We pray in a special way a blessing on Gabriel Begley as he shares the bread of life with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A pastor from Angola describes his youth having grown up on a farm with 10 orange trees. His father allowed him and his rest of his brothers to eat from all nine of the trees, but one tree was not to be touched. No, this was not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This was just one of the 10 orange trees that the father said was dedicated to to God. As this pastor from Angola was describing this tree, he said he kind of likened it to the tree of knowledge and good and evil, not that if he touched it he would die in the day thereof, but this was a holy tree. This was a dedicated tree. This was a tree that demarcated God's authority and claim, uh, not holy in the sanctify, sanctified sense, but in a dedicated sense. In the Bible, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, uh, Proverbs reads, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of your produce, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. 
Ellen White comments on this verse. She says, This scripture teaches us that God, as the giver of all, of all our benefits, number one, has claim upon all of our benefits. Number two, that his claim should be our first consideration. And number three, that a special blessing would attend all who honor this claim. This is found in Councils on Stewardship, page 65. We have just uh, concluded our annual council uh, meetings at the General Conference, and we see that the church is still going strong and still progressing forward by God's grace. We're finding that tithe is somewhat stable around the world. We're finding that local church offerings, especially the mission offering, is uh, the ones that are weak at this time. So we want all of you who are online and in the house to consider, uh, we, we want to praise the Lord for, our, for God's people's faithfulness, but to not forget about missions offering and local church and conference offerings as well. This morning, as you worship the Lord with your heart and with your action of tithe and offerings, take a moment to recognize his authority, his goodness, his care, and his claim upon our lives. Today's offering is for the local church budget, and you can go to avenusgiving.org, or you can go to the link found on the screen, or you can actually mail in your checks to that actual mailing address, and we have our faithful treasurers who check that mailbox and deposit those checks to make sure that these funds go to the Lord's service. If you can bow your heads at this time to ask for the Lord's blessing on all of our tithes and offerings, let us pray. Gracious Father, it's been about now, what, six months, eight months that we've been separated. And Lord, we praise you that we can still give of ourselves to you. Father, we ask that you continue to sustain us with that giving spirit. Father, it is in your essence of who you are to give, 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 forgive, and give, and give. We produce that in us. Father, we thank you that we can be faithful with our tithes, but may we be just as generous with our offerings as well. Lord, bless the mission of the church. Bless the 1040 window of the church. Bless the missionaries of the church. Bless all that comes in and all that goes out. And may your special blessing rest upon those who give from the Tridelphia family. We ask humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe... Maybe he was just feeling a little tired. Or maybe he was just plain lazy. Anyway, the man who was making the carriage wheels, ah, he decided to take a shortcut. Well, maybe you don't know about making carriage wheels because we don't ride in carriages anymore. But a carriage wheel was normally made of wood. It's really big, the carriage wheels. And they had spokes, wooden spokes that held the wheel, the rim, and the center together. And when you were making a carriage wheel, it was very important that you had your spokes strong and well-fitting. So this man who was making this carriage wheel, he made all his spokes, and when he was busy putting them into the wheel, he realized that some of those spokes were a little bit shorter than others. And he thought to himself, oh my, I don't feel like redoing all these spokes again. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to get little pieces of wood, little wedges of wood, and I'm just going to poke them in and the little space that's missing, we'll just poke it full of little wedges of wood and then we'll paint the whole thing and no one will know. It's such a small little thing, no one will know. So that is what they did or what that man did, what the carriage builder did. He made this wheel and he poked his little pieces of wood in and he painted everything and there it was done. It looked beautiful once it was painted. Well, we wouldn't know about the story except Ellen White and her grown-up son Willie and some other folks ended up using this carriage. Of course, they didn't know about the wheel. But they used this carriage. They were busy looking for a nice place to have a, a special Bible school that summer. So they were riding around and looking for good spots. And they were using that carriage. 
So as they rode along and enjoyed the beautiful scenery, they didn't know that every time that wheel went over a bump, those little pieces of wood were busy working themselves loose. And then at the worst possible moment, wah, the wheel just fell right off that carriage, just right off the carriage and lay on the ground. Well, it didn't just fall right off. Of course, the carriage can't ride on four wheels, so the whole carriage tipped over and smashed, and all the people inside were thrown around, and it was a very big accident. The horse reared up, and he didn't know what was going on, and there was a big moment of panic. Well, fortunately, fortunately, or providentially, really, because God must have sent his angel, everyone was okay. Uh, people were a little bit bruised and, and Ellen White's dress was all torn, but that was okay. Everyone was all right. Even the horse was okay. They managed to calm the horse down and Willie untied the horse, unharnessed him from the carriage and, and, and petted him until he calmed down and then tied him to a post nearby and said to the others, well, I, I don't know what happened, but I'm going to walk back to town and get us another carriage. You just wait here. So, so Ellen White and her friends that were with, they didn't have anything else to do, so they walked around the carriage and they thought, oh, why did the wheel just, just fall to bits like that? And they looked and then they discovered those short spokes in the wheels and they realized, aha, someone didn't care about details. Someone decided to take a shortcut. And I think for all of them, they thought about this. And that's still a really good lesson. Sometimes we think, ah, no one will notice if I don't do a job properly. Oh, it won't hurt anyone. We'll just do it quickly or we'll just hide it under the bed or whatever else. But details really do count. Sometimes they can even be life-threatening. So it's good to remember, let's be faithful also in the details. Today's scripture is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verse 5. Luke, chapter 5, verse 5. The Bible reads, 
But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Happy Sabbath, church. It's great to be with you here. Um, We spent, as Gerald said, a couple of hours before praising in the the amphitheater, which is a beautiful place. Uh, And today, even though a little cold, we enjoy the sunlight and the blue skies. It's just a phenomenal, beautiful autumn Sabbath. Well, it's been a long time since uh, I don't preach here, and uh, no, it's not a complaint. I said this morning the same thing. It's, it's not a complaint at all. I actually find it uh, to be wisdom on the part of those who choose the preachers. So, uh, but, uh, you know, these past weeks after Gerhard called me, I've been looking for, for options in Scripture and uh, found a very simple story that can teach us some deep things about the will of God for our lives. And I want to share that with you this morning. Uh, Let us start by reading once again that passage in the fifth chapter of Luke, verse 5. And it reads, But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Well, there are two ways of looking at the world at dawn. Everything depends on what you have been doing with the night. To those who stretch and yawn at daybreak, It can be a time of delicious lowness and calmness before the rat race of the day begins, a time for noticing how good that oatmeal taste is, and a time to watch the birds sing or glide across a breezeless lake, or a time to feel the warmth that comes through the window that eastern window as you sit and read your morning devotion. To those who end their work at dawn, it can be a bleak and depressing time, a time when the sunlight seems so cold and sharp, when the car doesn't want to start up, when muscles ache and food tastes flat, and the only thought that inspires hope is sleep. Long, sweet, delicious sleep. Well, as I age, and this applies to Annie as well, I believe, the transition from night owl to morning person is well underway. But like many of you, I have experienced both extremes of this matinal spectrum. Well, each morning, these two views of dawn collide in parking lots, in train stations, and along the shores of serene lakes like the Lake of Galilee and Gennesaret. Now, to those that may have ever doubted that the scriptures deal with the real stuff of daily living, observe that our text today is set at just that odd hour of the day when the workers of the night meet the people of the day. I would have wished to see the dawn this morning, not in Hagerstown, Maryland, but perhaps on the shores of Galilee, of that lake, listening to that gentle lap of small waves on the damp sand, watching the light still up over the mountains that you see on the other side of the lake. And you know, I never really read these passages without going there 
in my imagination and take a walk like Jesus did on the western side of the shore. He strolled there on the quiet moments of his day, the only times where it was permitted to him. It seems to be a natural place for reflection, for devotion, a place to find the quiet center in your life before the morning winds whips up the daily waves. But as calm as this scene appears to be in my imagination, I am sure that there were men who never found their time around this lake anything but a chore and a burden, a place where muscles ached and salty perspiration ran into the corners of their mouths. And nothing in all the world seemed so hateful as fish that refused to be caught. If, if curses would catch fish instead of nets, then I'm sure Peter and his companions would have been tremendously successful that morning. <laughs> but the fact remains. And on that particular night, they had not been at all successful. Ten hours of throwing a heavy net into the water and then slowly sorting through the strands as it was hauled into the boat. But that exercise produced not a single fin. And what was maddening to them was that Galilee is, even till this day, an incredibly rich fishing ground where densely packed shoals of fish an acre in size can be seen just beneath the surface. So great was their frustration that our text, Luke 5, 5, implies that they stubbornly continued washing and mending their nets, even though Jesus had begun to preach to an early crowd that was gathering around him just a few feet away. There are Christians, brothers and sisters, who respond to their failures with an angry determination to work even harder, even while Jesus is standing just a few feet away from them, telling them, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I know I'm guilty of this. I have done it way too many times, more than I would like to admit. Back to the Bible verse. While Mark and Matthew speak of Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee and abruptly calling Simon, Andrew, James, and John to follow him, you can find that in Matthew chapter 4 and Mark chapter 1, only Luke tells us the story of this miraculous catch of fish preceding the call. In Luke's gospel, this is not the first time Simon and Jesus meet because Jesus has already been to Simon's home in Capernaum and has healed his mother-in-law. Perhaps that explains a little bit why Simon is so willing to let Jesus into his boat and use it as a floating pulpit. Well, we have usually explained this passage as though the only reason why Jesus asked Peter to put his boat out in the water was that so he can better preach to the crowd that was pressing in on him. But I choose to believe that the Lord Jesus also wanted to do something special for Peter, something that could have never occurred if Peter had remained on the shore, cursing over his dirty and torn nets that produced nothing that night. The Lord Jesus wanted to put Peter in a position where all that he could do was to sit and listen to the gospel of the kingdom. Where he, Peter's type A, task-oriented self would have nothing to do but to sit and hear the good news 
while that boat was rocking back and forth gently. Some of us need that time of forced inactivity that the Lord Jesus pushes on us. Some of us need these moments each Sabbath in God's house when we can discover that the world has already been created and will survive without the help of men, even without my personal involvement. And so Peter, probably, probably reluctantly, straightened his back and left his half-washed nets when Jesus asked him to, wishing that Jesus would just cut that sermon short so people like himself can go quickly home and sleep. But that was not at all what Jesus intended to do that morning. For when the sermon ended, Jesus turned to Peter beside him in the boat and in a strangely authoritarian voice told him, or actually ordered him, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. If if Jesus, I keep on thinking about this scene, and if Jesus was calculating to push this fatigued and disheartened Peter to the very brink of frustration, he couldn't have chosen a better approach. Ask a man who is rested to give you a hand to do your favor that involves heavy physical labor, and you may just get a positive answer, but perhaps a little with a little reluctant good grace, but ask a man who just finished the graveyard shift to go back and do it all over again, and you'll very likely hear the ligaments of his patience and good nature snap, crackle, and pop. But Jesus did it. This is what Ellen G. White writes in the 25th chapter of The Desire of Ages. Let me read this to you. The discourse ended. Jesus turned to Peter and bade him launch out into the sea and let down his net for a draught. But Peter was disheartened. All night he had taken nothing. During the lonely hours he had taught of the faith of John the Baptist, thought I might have said, uh, who, has, who was languishing alone in his dungeon. He had thought of the prospect before Jesus and his followers of the ill success of the mission to Judea and the malice of the priests and rabbis. Even his own occupation had failed him. And as he watched the empty nets, the future seemed dark with discouragement. Well, at first glance, it probably seemed like mere carelessness to Peter, a kind of foolish command from a carpenter who didn't know what Peter had been going through all night. But on second glance, it may have seemed to Peter like the most ignorant suggestion he had ever heard. Fish in the daylight, when those nasty little creatures beneath the surface could see every move you make. Is that for real, Lord? I don't think so. And push out into the deep to cast down the nets? Any child who had grown up around the lake knew that fish were found not in the shallows along the shore or in the deep portions of the lake, but actually in the middle depths, a half mile away or so from the shore. And why return to the lake just now when a whole night's labor has made it abundantly clear that the fish were just not in the mood to be caught at the moment? A dozen thoughts like these must have raced through Peter's tired brain when Jesus ordered him to put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. Now, as if all of these practical objections were not enough, what about the professional embarrassment 
Peter would suffer when the fishermen in there on the shore would see him casting his nets in the glare of noon, in the middle of the day of noon. Peter could stand many, many things, but being laughed at, that was not one of them. Why did this good man, Jesus, whom he otherwise respected tremendously, have to push him into such a humiliating corner? Peter would not presume to walk into the carpenter's shop and instruct Jesus on how to build a chair. Why should he obey the commands of a man who knew much about nails and kinds of woods, but nothing about nets and lines and fishy psychology? Peter was poised on the pinnacle of the moment. If he said no to this kind teacher, to this good friend, he could wash away whatever hopes he had to ever knowing if he really was the chosen one of Israel, the Messiah. And if he said yes to this Jesus, he must, he must willingly throw aside all the knowledge and experience that 30 years of fishing to this lake, in this very lake, had brought him. It was a hard, a very hard moment in Peter's life. And when we start reading Luke 5.5 5 and read his response to Jesus, we may believe that his answer to this request of Jesus was to be a qualified no. Master, he says, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Master, he says, the facts of our experience don't mesh with your request. Master, he says, you don't really know what you're asking of us. But then comes one of those momentous words upon which a whole life hangs. Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, at thy word, at thy word, I will let down the net. Master, even though we are dog-tired and sleepy, and all of our effort has, has have been just a dismal failure, nevertheless, at your word, I will do as you ask. Jesus, even though all of my experience runs in the other direction, even though my human will is clamoring to refuse you just now, nevertheless, at your word, I will obey. I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that that single word, nevertheless, may have been the most important word that Peter ever spoke. Though for another 30 years, Peter would preach hundreds of sermons and discuss thousands of times the content of scriptures. No word that he, sco he spoke on any of those occasions was half so significant, so significant in his life, in his personal life, than that solitary word, nevertheless. I have checked the grammar book more than a few times to prepare this sermon, and it tells me that nevertheless is a, is a part of speech known as an adversative. That it stands in opposition to, as an adversary of, whatever has preceded it. In colloquial English, we might be prone to say but or yet, but neither one of those recent additions to the language have anything like the grandeur and the profound meaning of nevertheless. It is a word that stands outside of time. It actually sums up all that has gone before it, but it is not a part of that past or the attitudes of that past, nor a part of the actions of that past. It anticipates the change that is going to come with the future. 
but it does not yet state what the future or that change will be. Nevertheless, it's a word that belongs to the language of conversion. For like conversion, it implies a turning around, a maneuvering about, a change in direction. In the Apostle Paul's immortal words, and we all know this passage by heart, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And in the psalmist confession in Psalm 73, we read, Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am convinced that there cannot be a more important word coming from the lips of modern Christians like you and I. Those who are seeking to know the will of God for their lives than the word nevertheless. You know, when all the accumulated sins of our years point in one direction, and the thing with the, which the Lord wants us to do lies in the exact opposite direction, it is time to say, nevertheless, at thy word, I will do this thing. When we are struggling with one of those hard points that come to all of our lives, in our careers, or our marriages, our education, and we find that our human wills and desires are set 180 degrees apart from what Scripture tells us to do or teach us to do, it is time to say, nevertheless, I will obey. Too often, the doctrine of God's abundant forgiveness leads us to conclude that we can follow the path of human willfulness right now, today, because he is going to make everything come out right in the end. This is a very, a very typical portion of modern philosophy, and you can even hear words on some of the lyrics of modern songs, some of them quasi-spiritual, that, that basically say, it doesn't matter the path you're on, because at the end of the day, it will be all right. It will be made right at the end. We take a detour around those hard change points that God put in our path, to show us the difference between his will for our lives and our will for our lives. We try to avoid the necessity of bowing in obedience before the plan that the Lord Jesus has for our lives. We assume that the will of God will follow us, follow us around like the balloon follows the little boy who attaches its string to his belt. But I'm here, I'm here to tell you today that it is not so. The Lord Jesus intentionally brings up those moments when we are forced to choose between our way of thinking, our own way of thinking, and his way of thinking. Between our desires for our lives and his desires for our lives. Notice with me, brothers and sisters, this morning, that Peter does not make his decision to obey this command of Jesus on the basis of some whim of the moment or some strong emotion, for that will be just as wrong as never to obey at all. And I will say that again. Peter does not make his decision to obey Jesus on the basis of some whim of the moment or some strong emotion, for that would be just as wrong as never to obey at all. There is a kind of Christianity abroad in our world today that has no more substance to it 
than the, the strong feelings of excitable personality. A Christianity that is long on emotion, but very short on biblical content. But Peter, Peter recognizes just one and one only authority that can cause him to obey when all his human logic points in the other direction. And that authority is the word of the Lord Jesus. Nevertheless, he says, at thy word I will let down the nets. Peter did not agree to obey the command of Jesus because his heart was at that moment running over with love for his master. No, at that moment he was probably more frustrated with his master than ever before in their relationship. Jesus managed to push tired Peter to the edge of his good-naturedness. And Peter recognized that if he was going to obey this strange command from Jesus, he was going to have to put the whole weight of his personality into trusting the word of Jesus. For nothing else could be depended on. Nothing else could be depended on. What about today, brothers and sisters? What about today? Nothing else can be depended on except for the word of Jesus. You may have acquired a taste for self-help books. You may be dressing for success and managing everyone around you in one minute or less. You may know all of the latest mega trends and be amply prepared for future waves of evolved thinking and philosophies that are coming our way. But you will never know what God has called you to do with your life. And I will never know what he has called me to do with my life until we listen to the word of the Lord Jesus. You may have labored through the pages of the Clarity Cleanse or the Wisdom of Sundays, perhaps the Judgment Detox, and these are all big bestsellers this 2020. Perhaps you may have read the latest biography of Duke Harry and uh, his wife, Meghan Markle, but uh, you will never know what God intends for your womanhood or your manhood until you're you find it in the pages of, of his word, of scripture. You may have earned a brilliant academic degree or be laboring away at, at night school, but you will never know what truth is until you discover in the pages of scripture that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom. Nothing else can be depended on except the word of God. And that's, I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that much of the anxiety through which we pass, and I can testify of this, as we try to make decisions about the future, would disappear, would disappear if we, if we would trust that God will reveal himself to us, even today, through the pages of his word. The word of God is no static revelation. It is not a dead document. No, and it shouldn't be there on a corner collecting dust. This is the living and active word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts of the intentions of the heart. You may be anxious, or insecure, who is not in 2020. You may feel that your career or your marriage is heading down a long, dark tunnel. You may be overwhelmed with the frustrations of managing a home or raising children. But if with Peter, if you just do like Peter did, if with Peter you can sum up all of your, all of your temptations to doubt and still say, 
Nevertheless, at thy word, I will obey. You will hear the voice of the Lord Jesus speaking to you through his word as clearly as if he were sitting there in the same boat with you. As clearly as if he were sitting there on the same boat with you. And remember, and this is just amazing, he always is in the same boat with you. He is sitting there among all the fish you thought would never swim into your net, among all of the blessings you were sure would never come your way. He is waiting patiently for the day when you and I realize that the highest position to which a man or woman can rise in this world is to kneel at the feet of Jesus. That was Peter's choice that morning. What will be your choice today? What will be my choice today? Let us move out into a world of choices and decisions with the calm assurance that as we submit to the word of Jesus Christ, we will find answers to our questions, direction from above at every fork of the way on the road and grace to help in times of need. Let me start this conclusion by reading one longer portion of this 25th chapter of Desire of Ages. And Ellen G. White writes, During that sad night on the lake, when they were separated from Christ, the disciples were pressed hard by unbelief and weary weary with fruitless toil. But his presence kindled their faith and brought them joy and success. So it is with us. Apart from Christ, our work is fruitless. And it is easy to distrust and murmur. But when he is near and we labor under his direction, we rejoice in the evidence of his power. It is Satan's work to discourage the soul. It is Christ's work to inspire with faith and hope. The deeper lesson which the miracle conveyed for the disciples is a lesson for us also. That he whose word could gather the fishes from the sea could also impress human hearts and draw them by the cords of his love so that his servants might become fishers of men. They were humble and unlearned men, those fishers of Galilee. But Christ, the light of the world, was abundantly able to qualify them for the position for which he had chosen them. The Savior did not despise education. For when controlled by the love of God and devoted to his service, intellectual culture is a blessing. But he passed by the wise men of his time because they were so self-confident that they could not sympathize with suffering humanity and become collaborators with the men of Nazareth. In their bigotry, they scorned to be taught by Christ. The Lord Jesus seeks the cooperation of those who will become unobstructed channels for the communication of his grace. Wow. The first thing to be learned by all who would become workers together with Christ is the lesson of self-distrust. And I'll make a parenthesis here because I feel I have to. You know, the world is bombarding us with the notion that there is a lot of goodness in ourselves. It's deep within us. We just have to uncover it and express it. We have to be very confident in ourselves and go out and win the day. Let me read this portion again. The first thing to be learned by all who would become workers together with God is the lesson of self-distrust. Then they are prepared to have imparted to them the character of Christ. This is not to be gained through education in the most scientific schools. It is the fruit 
of wisdom that is obtained from the divine teacher alone. Amen. Thomas Campus, a great man of prayer, wrote a very short thing, what I believe should be the continual whispering of our hearts. As thou wilt, what thou wilt, when thou wilt. This, I believe, is our whole duty to God. This is our whole duty to God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for scripture. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing moments Jesus spent on earth teaching us about the Father. Thank you, Lord, for this story with Peter and this encounter with Peter. And Lord, thank you for, for the lessons we learn from it. Lord, we recognize that self what we believe, we believe is our own good experience gets in the way of you using us fully. And we want to ask for forgiveness. And Lord, for divine help to remove self from us so we can be useful to you, so we can have the certainty that you want to give us today and walk this life knowing exactly who our Father is and who our Redentor is. Lord, Please bless us today so we can submit, we can yield fully to the word of Jesus, so we can study scripture like never before and become fishers of men. May we tell this world that Jesus is coming really soon and be prepared for that, come, for, for that glorious morning that will come very, very soon. Bless each brother and sister this morning and may we all make this decision in your favor all of this we ask humbly in the name of jesus amen <laughs>